Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, I come from One Ventures, as I was just introduced, and I'd like to talk about three things today. First of all, give you some background on our firm, One Ventures. Secondly, talk to you a little bit about the healthcare part of our firm and ha how we uh, invest in biotech and medical devices in, in our sector. And then lastly, I'm going to touch on some of the impacts that uh, COVID-19 has had on our business and then try to extrapolate those to have a look at what's happening uh, in biotech, venture capital investment worldwide and, and what might be the future. Uh, bearing in mind that I don't have a crystal ball and none of us do, so some of that future-looking aspects are really, we're very early in the process, so it's too early to tell. So let's just go through our One Ventures in the first instance. So we are an Australian-based uh, venture capital firm and we invest in technology and healthcare investments. We have about 400 million in funds under management. Uh, we were founded, and what sets us apart from many VC firms is we were founded by founders. So the three managing partners who I'll talk about in a moment, each, each of those had their own companies and have built and exited them. And that separates us from many of our peers. Uh, we're also the other separation from many of our peers is our LPs are all high net worth uh, individuals, and they all have a passion for investment in innovation, whether that be in tech or in, or in healthcare, and are really supportive of, of our investments. These are our funds that we have under management and one that we're actually raising at the moment. So the first fund uh, was Fund 1, launched in 2010. That was a small $40 million fund. Uh, fund 2 uh, launched in 2014, $75 million fund. Uh, another closed end, both of those closed end 10-year uh, funds. Um, the healthcare fund, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about as we go through this presentation, is uh, is all focused on healthcare. That's $170 million fund three. Uh, we've made six investments to date. We probably have room for about eight to ten investments, and that's in year four of a 10-year fund. Last year, we launched a, a venture credit fund. I'm not going to talk about that today, but certainly at another time, happy to have our venture credit team uh, come back and talk to you about that fund. It's quite different and unique in this environment and is doing really well, especially at the moment in these times of coronavirus. And then uh, we're also launching uh, Fund 5, and it's got its first close probably um, Q3 of this year, and they're looking at uh, investing up to $200 million. Um, in probably only six to eight companies. So it's really a growth stage venture fund, that one. And that'll have a, mostly a technology uh, focus to it because they're looking at companies that have probably greater than $5 million in revenue. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, our high net worth investors that invested as LPs in, um, in One Ventures are very supportive of our program. And uh, we have about $65 million of additional co-investment funds under management where we've done rounds into some of our portfolio companies and they've decided to double down. These are some of the names of the companies that we've invested in and, and some of them may seem familiar to you uh, and they go across all of our funds. Uh, this slide here shows our, our team at One Ventures and as I mentioned before, the three managing partners that formed One Ventures were Michelle Deeker, uh, Paul Kelly and Anne-Marie Burkle. Uh, Michelle may be known to some of you, but she's really well known in the technology entrepreneurial sector. Uh, she formed several technology companies before she, she founded One Ventures. Uh, most uh, well known of these was a company called uh, giftvouchers.com or Ecom Industries, which she exited in 2005 and, and had about a 70% IRR for the investors that invested in that fund, uh, in that company, sorry. Paul Kelly, uh, the head of our healthcare um, for part of the business, he's an endocrinologist by training uh, and started uh, his first uh, biotech um, foray was in uh, the mid-90s in, in the UK and then later in the US. Uh, and probably his most well-known company that he founded uh, was a company that um, that started in the UK and then IPO'd and then was bought by um, Sequinome in um, in the early 2000s. Uh, and then we have Anne-Marie Burkle, who's founded many companies, particularly in the Queensland ecosystem. She's very well known uh, as having having sat on many boards of those startup companies and sits um, and is is well known in in that ecosystem for also being the founding CEO of the one of the first incubators, probably in Australia, but definitely in Queensland, called iLab. Uh, 
Uh, and the fourth, the fourth partner just recently um, has been promoted to partner is, is Grant Chamberlain, and he's heading up uh, Fund 5 that's just going out to raise money at the moment and was formerly the head of M&A um, at Merrill Lynch in Australia. So I'm going to talk now. I won't. I won't go through the rest of the rest of the people in our team. But I guess to say that really we have a very hands-on approach, and so many of the people in our team have got hands-on experience managing companies, and that's really um, where we try to to lend our hand. We're, we're in the the companies that are really growing fast, and they need uh, they need resources around the boardroom table, and at times we step in and and take management roles or bring in management to help those companies succeed. In our healthcare team, uh, you can see I'm sitting there. We've got Paul Kelly heading the team. John Westward has just recently joined our team. He was previously CFO for a company called Elastogen uh, that was sold to Allergan a couple of years ago. Uh, we've got Gabriel Duvel, who assists us, comes from a commercial pharmaceutical background, uh, and then two uh, venture partners based in the US that we lean on a lot. The first is a guy called Dr. Dan Baker. He was the head of immunology at Janssen, which is Johnson & Johnson's uh, research arm, and helped bring three monoclonal antibodies to market, led those Remicade, Stellara, and Symphony that together are worth about $13 billion in annual sales. Uh, and then the second person we lean on quite a lot is a guy called Jim Scoper, uh, and he's a venture partner at One Ventures, but Priors brings about 20 years of venture capital investment um, at a firm called MPM Capital, one of the largest um, biotech VCs in the US. Fund three, I said I'd talk about our biotech fund and what we look for. We've got about 170 million under, under management. It's a closed end fund. We're in uh, partway through year four. Um, we look to invest 10 to 25 million per company uh, and look for companies that really are at or near clinical development. Um, they need to be therapeutics, medical devices, or diagnostics, and that's as measured by uh, as if they were to be approved by the FDA under those categories. And so we don't typically invest in areas around allied health or areas that, um, you know, like e-health. We're really more focused on therapeutics, devices, and diagnostics. We look for technologies that have got a really strong market pool. They need to have an unmet medical need that we're solving here and it needs to be competitive. Ultimately, we need to be able to exit these companies within our fund horizon. So they've got to have a really clear development path. They've got to be able to be approved uh, in a straightforward way that clinical trials have got to have endpoints that can be measured and easily understood. And the products also need to be um, need to have a reimbursement strategy in place. And this is even more critical for companies that sit in the device and diagnostic space where reimbursement can sometimes be really, really important to getting market traction. And those companies are typically sold with market traction. We like always to invest with people we can work with and those are some of the very first early criteria that we look for in investing in a company. And lastly, I wanted to talk to you about what the impact COVID's having on our business and then more broadly what it's having on the, on the biotech VC uh, as a whole. So I think it would be fair to say that the first four to six weeks of this, and it's, it's just sort of starting to settle down now, we spent our time, as I think virtually everybody in our biotech VC space worldwide, spent their time looking at their own companies, uh, shoring up the balance sheets of any of those companies that needed uh, either to have ex uh, extend their runway through maybe a bridge financing, looking at their liabilities and ensuring that they, could, they have at least 12 to 18 months cash in each one of our businesses. Uh, and that, that's been a big process. Some of our companies were right in the middle of going out to raise a Series B or a Series C. Uh, and so we need to do some internal rounds. We need to extend and, and, and see how those companies can survive this economic challenge. The other aspects that are important in our portfolio, as, as are important in most biotech portfolios, are companies that have, have got delays in, in, in most of the R&D that's going into this space. The delays are around things like clinical trials. I saw a report earlier this week that 41% of clinical trials that were ongoing on the major database, clinicaltrials.gov, have either moved, from, moved to suspended or abandoned in the last month. 
that's a huge number of clinical programs in diseases outside of, uh, of COVID that are no longer recruiting into clinical trials. And that's because patients can't come into hospitals. There's all sorts of risks around doing those sorts of those sorts of clinical trials at the moment. So we're seeing delays across the board in clinical trials. Um, we're also seeing some delays in, in terms of lab activities and manufacturing processes. In some instances where resources are being diverted to the COVID pandemic and in other instances where actually the lockdowns have reduced the capacity of people to go into work and actually deliver the experiments they need to deliver. And that's dependent on where our companies are being based uh, and whether they've been deemed as essential services in those in those areas and, and, of course, the risk profile of the employees in those companies. So the first four to six weeks was really assessing what are the risks for each of our companies and how are we helping them manage them. And I think in large part it was focused on shoring up the balance sheets of our, of our current portfolio. And I think if, if we talk to our peers and our syndicate investors, that's really what they've been focused on over the last four to six weeks. We've just now started moving into uh, screening new opportunities. We still need to fill out our fund, as do many VCs worldwide. And, and in fact, there's, there's more venture capital available in the biotech space than there's ever been before, uh, both in Australia but more importantly internationally. In, in the last three years, more capital was raised than raised in the previous seven years combined. So there's a lot of dry powder out there and there's going to be a need to invest in biotech. So it, deals will continue to happen. We think in the medium term, as I said, investments will continue, but biotech investors are going to be very cautious about investing in programs that that immediately need to recruit into clinical trials that will struggle. So we'll be looking for programs where we can continue to advance those programs uh, and, and areas where clinical trials can continue, such as you know, healthy volunteer studies here in Australia and, and aspects like that. As we look to the long term, our you know, I, if I had a crystal ball, I'd love to be able to tell you where we think it's going to go. But we do think that biotech should fare better than other sectors. We certainly have had a lot of focus on our sector during this, this uh, crisis as people look to science as being a way to solve problems like this. I think that also, you know, biotech does, people still have unmet medical needs. We're pre-revenue generating in large part, so we're not driven by consumer demands and retail spend. Uh, our supply chains will be impacted and will probably be impacted in the long term, but we do believe biotech will, uh, will fare better than most other sectors uh, in the long term. Uh, and then lastly, you know, we all look to what are the biotech exits going to look like. There are still some IPOs, amazingly, that have got away in the US uh, in the last few weeks. We suspect those were definitely well into the pipeline prior to coronavirus. Um, we do anticipate those IPOs will slow over the summer. And I think, you know, if I looked at a Silicon Valley uh, bank series of blogs over the last couple of weeks and looking at endpoints, our kind of one of our, our key industry uh, newsletters at Collator of Media, I think that it's pretty clear to say that we'll move from IPOs probably into more deals being done, transacted, where pharma companies are buying smaller companies, and that will represent our exits over the next probably 12 to 18 months more so than IPOs. Mm -hmm. But if I had a crystal ball, I'd love to be able to uh, to explore that and, and know exactly where, where we'll be. Um, but... Really, we feel strongly that the biotech investments are, are an area that will continue to grow. We know that clinical trials will come back on. We know that other areas of business like lab function in many places are seen as essential services or moving into that place and they'll continue. And so we really are pretty upbeat, uh, both about our portfolio and about the, uh, the world biotech VC industry as a whole. So thank you very much.